Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. The apostle John is exiled on the isle called Patmos, a little rock island out in the sea. He is there being punished for a crime. His crime is he is a real believer and a real servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say it this way. He is exiled because he is a real old time Bible Christian. Now you got to remember they've abandoned him out there on that rock to be on his own, to starved to death, whatever may happen to him. He's all alone out there. And he's not the young man that laid his head on the Lord's chest at the supper. He's up in years now. He's aged and he's all by himself. Yet we find in this first chapter, in verse number 10, with all this going on, this may be the darkest. This may be the lowest. This may be the most depressing time uh, of this Christian's life. And yet we find in verse number 10 uh, that in that dark place he is still in tune with the Lord. Uh, the Bible said uh, that it was dark. He was abandoned. He is all alone paying for a crime uh, that is not a crime. And all of a sudden the Bible said he is still in the spirit on the Lord's day. He had not waved the white flag. He had not given up. He had not swelled up and got mad at it, God, uh, even out there in the darkness, out there all alone, uh, he is still caught up in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What happens not only do we see that he's in tune with God, we see a truth from God. The Bible said that he heard a voice behind him. You ever wondered why? You might not think this way, but why did God come up behind him? Why did the Lord Jesus come up behind him? Well, if you ever been in the military and law enforcement, I believe the Lord said, John, uh, I got you six. For all of them don't know what that means. He said, John, don't worry about it. I got you back. I don't know about you, but it sure helps me to know that the Lord uh, has got my back. In verse number 12, you, he speaks to John, and the Bible says that John, uh, what's your Bible? The Bible said, verse 12, that John heard a voice behind him. Verse 12, he turned. What's your Bible? Bible, to see the voice. Yeah. Wait a minute now, John. You can't turn and see a voice. Well, Genesis chapter 3 said that the voice of the Lord came walking in the cool of the evening. John wasn't expecting to see all that he saw. But when he saw, when he turned toward that voice, here's the point, and I'll get to the message. When you hear the voice of God, wherever you hear it, turn toward the voice of God. And John turns around, and there he is in all of his glory, in all of his godliness, in all of his being. He is standing there shining, fire flashing out of his eyes, feet like a fine brass, a sword proceeding out of his mouth. And there's John looking at him. And we come to our text, verse 17. And John said, when I saw him, that's John's way of saying, everything is about to change now. I mean, business is about to pick up in a more moment modern vernacular, John is saying, it's about to get real up in here. And for a few minutes tonight, I want to preach on that thought. It's about to get real up in here. John, all by himself, exiled in his darkness, in his depression, maybe in his defeat, he hears a voice behind him, and he turns toward that voice, and he said, you ain't never going to believe what happened when I saw him. God help us tonight and in the days of this week to turn toward that voice and see him. Not me, not you, not the singers, not the uh, the motel, not the beautiful building, but may we turn and see him because if we see him, it'll get real up in here. In verse 17 we say, see that it's about to get real up in here because we see a real revelation. Watch your Bible. He said, 
And when I saw him, I fell, watch these words, at his feet. Here's the revelation. We see the importance of Jesus. He didn't just crumble to the ground. He didn't say, I just fainted, had a heart attack, passed out. But he said, I fell at his feet. That is a symbol of humility. It is a symbol of worship. It is a symbol of him bowing down to the authority and the lordship and the power. In other words, John said, I knew him. But when I saw him on the Isle of Patmos, I couldn't do anything but fall out at his feet. He's everything. He's everything. He's everything. The importance of Jesus. No wonder, no wonder every night before Billy Graham would preach, George Bevshay would get up and sing, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. No wonder Paul the Apostle said, all these things that I accomplished, I count them but dumb. I count them all lost that I might win Christ. You know why? It doesn't matter how dark it is. It doesn't matter how depressed I am. It doesn't matter how defeated I feel. If I can just see him, it'll get real. I'll see how important he is. Not only does it reveal how the importance of Jesus, watch your Bible. He said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. It shows or reveals the insignificance of John. Now, I'm not going to argue with you. He didn't say I fell at his feet dead. But he said as dead. And I can't think of much that a dead man can do. There he is laying in front of the king of glory. He can't move. He can't speak. He can't add anything to Christ. He can't help himself. He can't do anything. In other words, you see in it, there's the importance of Jesus. He's our all in all. It only matters about him. John's not thinking about himself. John's only thinking about him. John's not bowing to himself. John is bowing to him. He's laying there as a dead man. I tell you what's wrong with us, we forget to die daily. We've not reckoned ourselves dead. We still think it's got something to do with us, but it doesn't. We are insignificant. We are really unimportant in the scheme, if you will, of things. It's all about Him, and it's nothing about me. John said, I thought I was nothing. I thought I was a zero. Then when I saw Him, I realized I was a zero with the rim knocked off of it. I was known. I was nothing. It, I didn't matter next time you puff up and say God why are you letting me go through this you remember it's all about him and it's not about you it's all about him and it's not about me the problem is you've not turned lately to the voice of God and saw him because if you ever see him the world will grow strangely dear. I remember when my son Bryce was laying at the Charleston Medical University tubes run down his throat into his head pick lines, IVs, a machine breathing for him. I told my wife, as a young preacher, young pastor, I told my wife, I said, I don't know why we've had to go through this and I don't know why he has. But I promise you, you got to remember, I was young. I'd been in the military. I'd been a police officer. Uh, I was full of grit. And I told my wife, I said, I promise you, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jesus why we had to go through this. I'm going to look him in the eye. My wife just looked kind of grinned and said, no you won't. I said, I promise you I will. She said, no you won't. I mean, I rose up out of my seat and swelled up. What makes you think I ain't man enough to ask him? I'm man enough to ask him. You don't think you married a man? I let my wife go through what you're going through. Let my son. I'm going to look him eyeball to eyeball and ask him what was the purpose. Why? When I did all my ranting, she said, no, you won't. I said, well, please tell me why you think I won't. I know you don't think I'm a coward. I know you don't. No. She said, because one glimpse of him. And none of that will matter anymore. The hymn writer said, just one glimpse of him in glory will all the tolls of life repay. 
It's about to get real up in here. If you see him, you'll have a real revelation. As we continue on in our verse, we'll see that it's about to get real up in here because of real revival. There's John laying at his feet. He's dead. Can't do a thing. I heard a man preach on what can a dead man do before I knew he was going to preach against what I believed. I yelled out, nothing! What can a dead man do? Nothing! There's John laying there doing nothing. Amounts to nothing. Accomplishing nothing. Able to add nothing. But look what happens. Watch it now. The Bible says that a fell at his feet is dead. And he laid... Look at that word late. I'm talking about a real revival. You know why? Because God touched him. I want you to know it was a particular touch. What's the word late? He didn't smite John on the side like the angel did Simon Peter when he woke him up in prison to lead him out. He didn't just brush up against him. He just didn't kind of smack him or in a rebuke on the back of the head or something. No, the Bible said that he laid his hand upon him. He laid it down there. meant he laid it on him and didn't move it. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but tonight I'd love to see him uh, and him just lay his hand on me I need a particular touch it's not my brother nor my sister but it's me oh lord I, I need that touch I need that particular touch I don't need a slap or a brush I want you to lay your hand upon me I need a particular touch it's not only a particular touch but it is a well let me let me just show you this John's laying at his feet is dead can do nothing. Jesus laid his hand on him. Now how in the world did Jesus do that? He had to stoop down or kneel down to where John was. John couldn't get to him. He had to kneel down where John was. Get down low where John was. And he laid his hand. He didn't just touch him and stand back up. Hallelujah. He got down there where John was and laid his hand upon him. I come by to tell somebody tonight, you think God hadn't laid his hand on you? Maybe you need to get dead at his feet. Maybe you need to get low at his feet. If you want God to come down in that mess you're in, get low enough. Get unimportant enough. Get humble enough. And God will come all the way down to where you are. He'll stoop down. He'll condescend and lay his hand upon you. A particular touch. Not only was it a particular touch, it was a powerful touch. He said he laid his right hand. In the Bible, the right side, the right hand, always the power of the hand of power, the position of power. I don't know about you. I don't just need a whole hum touch. I want a powerful touch. He said he laid his right hand, that same hand that he stretched his arm out and brought Israel out of bondage in Egypt, that same hand that he stepped out on nothing and meted out the water in the hollow of that hand. Every lake, every river, every sea, every ocean, every mud hole, every well, every creek, every branch. He meted it out, not in the palm, but in the hollow of that right hand. And then that same verse says, He hung all them galaxies and stars and moons and suns. You know how He done that? It said with the span. You know what a span is? It is the stretching out of the fingers. He didn't have to throw it into space. He didn't have to spin it. He just stretched His hand out. You talk about a powerful touch. All them galaxies galaxy solar system planets and suns went to rotating been rotating the same way on his plan ever since that same hand uh, that reached down uh, and lifted that little girl up and brought her back to life that same hand that touched the coffin in the city of Nain uh, and brought that boy back to life that same hand that he stretched out at Calvary and let him pierce with nails that same right hand that he held out over Jerusalem and said I would have gathered you under my wings and you would not come. That same hand that poured out the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, that same hand is the very hand that he touched John. 
John said when I saw him he laid his right hand upon me the hand of power that side of power I don't know about you but I need the power let me just put it this way I wasn't raised by I'm not a prophet nor a prophet son I wasn't raised by a preacher or a deacon my daddy was an old time head busting hard nosed means a rattlesnake hated everybody loved to fight so let me put it in some weaver language how I grew up that same right hand that knocked cancer out of you when it should have killed you that same right hand that pulled you from that fire that same right hand that supplied that money when you don't know where it come from that same right hand that has been knocking down your enemies so we could be here to, I don't know if that's a helping you tonight but I look back at where he brought me from and I know it was his mighty powerful right hand John said when I saw him he laid his right hand what's this is a personal touch said he laid his right hand upon me not upon us but upon me hey probably some of you thinking right now boy I wish he was here he sure needs to hear that no it ain't him I want God to touch you I want God to touch the church but I need him to touch me I need a personal touch you know why because we serve a personal God when I got saved is a personal God I was sitting six pews back on the preacher's right hand side didn't go that morning looking for God didn't have God on my mind didn't hear one word the preacher preached all of a sudden while the preacher was three quarters of the way back standing up in the pew hair in his face voice like a trumpet roaring like a lion spitting stomping sweating all over the place I was looking straight ahead thinking I wish he'd hurry up and dismiss us going to a family reunion all of a sudden the Holy Ghost came to that six pew pulled the blinders off my eyes I'm going to just tell my testimony this is what happened I was sitting in the middle of the pew I don't sit in the middle anymore because cause of this but didn't nobody ask me to raise my hand didn't nobody uh, look at me and say I believe God's dealing with you would you like to come uh, they didn't tell me a story about pulling out in the road and a tractor and trailer running over me and dying and uh, fill my feet on fire the Holy Ghost came it was him and me and he came right in that pew and showed me that, who I really was and showed me who he really was and they didn't sing 16 stanzas of just as I am the preacher didn't stop preaching I popped up right in the middle of that pew like a jack in the box kicked pocketbooks out of the way stepped over legs made my way to an old fashioned altar and listen it won't go in this new recovering fundamental ecumenical mix it all together till it all tastes good uh, but I knelt down in repentance and faith uh, they said did you pray a sinner's prayer I didn't know a sinner had a prayer I just knew he come I uh, looking for me and I got to looking for him he wanted me and and I want it here. I ain't saying I'm against it. I'm just telling what happened to me. I didn't go through an upper Romans road. I didn't go through a Philippian jail. I didn't travel in a Ephesian expressway. I got saved one on one. Me and him. My salvation's personal. My call to preach is personal. My need for power is personal. My desire for revival is personal. We serve a personal. God. It's about to get real up in here. I give you this and I'm finished. We see a real revelation. A real revival. What's this? He not only touched him, but he talked to him. Laid his right hand upon him, saying, I don't know about you, but it still amazes me that a thrice holy God has the time or the desire to speak with me matter of fact I've been in this thing long enough to realize he wants to speak to me a whole lot more than I want to speak to him I think I believe he's more interested in it than I am he speaks to him and then what he says to him we see that there's real rest what's what he says saying here's what he said fear not fear not see when you got the right person on your side you can rest calmly basically he said calm down 
I wonder what John was thinking. He's laying there at his feet, he's dead. And he probably thought, no man can see God and live. Jesus said, fear not. John thought, I'm an old man. Ain't no food out here. I can't hunt. I can't be, uh, plan anything. I got no strength. I'm probably going to starve to death. And Jesus said, fear not. John said, I don't know how I'm going to get off this island. I, my ministry's over. I'll never be effective for God. Uh, I don't know why I'm out here. Jesus said, uh, fear not. Doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Doesn't matter how bad it may seem. Uh, when you find him, uh, when you see him, you can rest uh, calmly. You won't need a nerve pill to sleep at night or a pet me up one to get you going in the morning. I'm glad, thank God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless his holy name. He knows how to come along and calm your storm. He said, Fear not. Fear not. What are you so afraid of, John? I'm here now. You might have been afraid and they sailed you out here, kicked you off the boat, and said, Hope you're starved to death. But I'm here. John had no idea he was going all the way out there in his old age to a rock in the middle of the ocean all by himself and he's going to run right into Jesus you ever noticed in your deepest storm that seems like when you run right into Jesus throw them three Hebrew boys in a the fire they're all full of faith they said well if he does he does if he don't we still ain't a bowing he said well we, we ain't okay tossed him in they went in the fire, messing around, boom, ran right into Jesus. Yeah. David said, I was a walking through the valley of the shadow of death, yeah. scared to death. And then he said, oh, wait a minute. I'll fear no evil. You know what happened? Right in the valley of the shadow of death, he bumped into him. He said, for thou art with me. John's exiled. John's exiled on an island dark and droom it, do, doom and gloom and oh, this is it and he bumps into Jesus I'm telling you right in your darkest hour you can rest calmly he says fear not I am the first and the last he said John before anybody else is here I was and when it's all gone I'll still be here. Amen. I like to say it like this. It all started with me. And it'll all stop with me. I'm the first and the last. And I'm everything in between. He said, John, not only can you rest calmly, but you can rest completely. My oldest two children, when they were younger, they were sharp. I mean, really. I wouldn't just say it. They were smart. So when we go on a trip... They were too smart to say, are we there yet? Because they knew I was smart enough that once I got where I was going, I would have stopped. I don't keep driving. When I got to the motel over, I didn't just keep riding around. I stopped when I got where I was going. So they would never say, are we there yet? But they'd always say, how much farther? How much farther? Now, I know this is years ago. Now, you have to remember, especially young folk, remember this is a long time ago. I think it was a Chevrolet Corsica. And the back seats, the back of the seats would pull down. So we'd make them pallets. You young folk had to Google or ask an older person what a pallet is. We'd make them pallets. And we'd let them lay their head in the folded down back seat. And the lower part of their body would be in the trunk. And they'd be laying there and we'd be driving. And they'd say, how much farther? And I'd give the Universal Father response. If you'd lay down and take a nap, a good one, probably by the time you take your nap and wake up, I'll probably have to wake you up when we get there. Just relax. Take it easy. Don't worry about it. Not one time did one of my kids ever say, Daddy, did you bring enough money to get gas? Did you check the air pressure and fill up the tank? Did you rent a motel room? Do you have directions? Do you know how we're going to get there? Do you? Never one time they asked me that. Never one time did they say, uh, do you have enough money to buy us food when we get there? Do you have enough put up to get us back home? Or wherever we need. They never asked me any questions like that. 
The only thing they'd say is, how much farther? And as they got older, they realized, a lot of times if we take a nap, sometimes they'd take a nap and they'd wake up too early and I'd pull over and say, we're going to get a bite to eat, get a snack. Try to get, get them a little snack. Lay back now, see how it works. But the many a times they'd lay down, fall asleep. We'd pull in. They'd crack it out. I'd say, go ahead and get up. We're here. And I come by to tell somebody tonight, maybe you all just climb up in the big arms of Jesus. Let him worry about it. I think I read this somewhere that when John F. Kennedy was president, you know, all that Cuban, Cuban missile crowd, all that was going on, they was having a big meeting in his office. All the head people were there. All of a sudden, a little child come walking down the hall and the military men begin to snap to attention. The Secret Service snapped to attention. He didn't have to knock on the door. He didn't have to get permission. When he got to the door of the president's office, they just opened it up. He walked in and the president stood up and said, we're taking a 15-minute break because I'm going to spend 15 minutes with John John. Right in the middle of all that crisis. I just want you to know, praise God, I ain't got to stand outside the throne room and wait on them to introduce me and get an audience. I ain't got to wait on him to hold out his scepter. Hallelujah. I can go walking right up in the throne room. The angels will throw the doors open. I can climb right up in his arms and tell him all about it. Spend time with him. I tell you, somebody tonight needs to say, I need to climb up in his arms. Quit worrying about how he's going to pay for that. Quit worrying about how he's going to take care of that. Quit worrying about how he's going to deal with that and just rest completely in the fact that he's the first and he's the last and he's everything in between. If you hear the voice of God tonight turn toward his voice because when I saw him If you enjoyed today's message head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons and don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.